All right. All right. Sorry about that delay. But um, so my talk is called the um, so my talk is called the uh, entrepreneurial equalizer. And keeping with our theme of overcoming adversity, I want to go over three main points today. One is the a correlation between entrepreneurship and socioeconomic mobility. Socioeconomic mobility is about moving from one social class to another, usually in an upward direction. The second thing is how we can use this knowledge and these principles to encourage small business education as well as basic uh, business principles around the world to help alleviate poverty. And third, while start why starting your own small business may not be as outlandish an idea as you may have originally thought. So first, let's talk about some statistics about overcoming adversity in today's business world. So of the 10 wealthiest people in the world, seven of them were born into middle or lower class families. And of the three that weren't, two of them are actually from the same family. Now of America's billionaires alone, 62% are self-made. And of the 25 wealthiest people in the world, 14 are entrepreneurs. Now furthermore, there's this quote down here that I really like. It's entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like most people won't, so you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't. Now the reason I like this is it kind of talks about how entrepreneurship is so deeply tied to adversity, that the two are essentially inseparable. There's almost no entrepreneur in the world that can say they haven't faced some sort of serious adversity uh, on their way to the top, unless of course they have daddy to give them a small loan of a million dollars, but that's a whole other story. Now, I want to talk also about the developing world and kind of areas where poverty, poverty is a lot more prevalent. So here we have a graph of, from 2005 to 2017, of three of the world's uh, most top developing economies, Brazil, China, and India. And what we have here is the green line tracks um, entrepreneurship, essential, um, how the number of registered businesses uh, on average per country. And the blue line tracks um, the poverty rate. Um, so from 2005 to 2017, what you can see is that the poverty rate was cut nearly in half on average between these three countries, from 18.92% to about 10.1%. And in that same period of time, the average number of registered businesses in each country nearly quadrupled from 4.11 million to 16.1 million. Now, this isn't just a random correlation or a coincidence. This is actually a serious um, relationship between the two that shows that increased small business entrepreneurship uh, leads to less poverty in areas. Now, how exactly does this happen? One of the main ways that we can encourage this and replicate this into our own communities is a process called microfinancing. And now it's something that sounds and looks a lot more complicated than it really is. The way it works is that first you have a group of donors or investors that give or donate their money to what's called a microfinance institution or an MFI. Um, now, they, this microfinance institution can either be a for-profit investment company or a non-profit charity. Um, that's why it tends donor slash investors. This microfinance institution then uh, goes to the developing world or areas that are underprivileged and finds micro entrepreneurs or people who desire to start their own business but lack the resources and funds and then gives them small loans. In developing areas, it can be as little as 50 bucks and in the United States, it's anywhere from 1500 to $8,000. Um, so they give them that sort of money. They also help them with advice, give them free consultation to kind of get their feet up and uh, eventually the goal is to make them self-sufficient. Now, the, uh, the results in this, just the United States alone, are actually really incredible. So in the United States, like I said, the threshold is from $1,500 to $8,000. And when you look at the statistics of how this has worked out in the United States, um, of the businesses that received a loan, on average, 60% of those businesses hired additional workers as a direct result of the loan they received. Furthermore, the average business that, um, the average loan created 2.4 jobs. And the 2.4 jobs that were created paid on average 25% higher than minimum wage. So it's something that is as, at maximum uh, $8,000 in the United States. You have the potential to create two and a half jobs that pay significantly more than minimum wage. And even the entrepreneurs themselves indicated, 70% indicated that their own housing improved as a result of their business improving. Now, why does this matter to you? You guys may be thinking this is cool, it sounds nice and everything, but like, why should I care about this? Now, in the United States, uh, we kind of have the stereotype of what a business is, of like people in suits and fanciness and all this bureaucracy. But in reality, when we look at America's 27.9 million businesses nationwide, the vast majority are actually small businesses with people working from home, 52% of which uh, work from home. 79% of entrepreneurs uh, are single employee companies, so of the, all the 
companies in the United States, 79% have just one individual uh, running them. And this really is the backbone of our economy. Now, what the main benefit to strengthening um, entrepreneurship and increasing uh, basic business education, increasing small business uh, ownership in general, is that not only do we get a stronger economy through entrepreneurs, but also more entrepreneurs equals stronger consumers and smarter consumers. Let me explain why that is. Now, in America, and actually in any capitalist economy, we do what's called voting with your dollar, which means that any time that you buy a McDonald's burger over uh, Burger King, or you buy Honda over a Toyota, you are essentially giving your stamp of approval to one company over the other, right? And therefore weakening one over its competitor. Now the reason this matters is because the more informed and smarter a consumer is, the more likely they are to make the right buying decision. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that maybe not due to their own fault are either misinformed or are uninformed and make decisions anyways and end up picking the wrong product. And businesses, there are certain unethical business practices that take advantage of this and um, make them buy products that are either uh, way higher than prices that are way higher than should be or of much lower quality. Uh, when you have a smarter consumer pool that knows more about what it's spending for, what it's buying, and why it's buying it, um, you have less, you're less likely to have these fraudulent businesses um, expand and stay in place. So essentially you have a safer, more fair economy for everyone. Now, the second one is a greater power spread. So in America, in this political sphere, and everyone kind of talks about how um, there's certain corporations that have a lot of power in specific industry, right? This idea of a monopoly. Um, and just simply put, the more competitors you have in a specific industry, the, less, the more competition there's gonna be. And the more competition there is, the lower prices are gonna be, the higher quality products are gonna be there, you have best, better customer service, and all in all, it's just gonna be a better industry. So when you look here, if the same market, right, whether it's 10, P, 10 competitors, versus five competitors, it's better to have 10 because they're gonna be competing more and they each have less market share and therefore it ensures that a monopoly can't be created. Now, finally, uh, I wanna sum up by creating one final point and that is that um, Great businesses aren't built in Manhattan size skyscrapers. They aren't built with CEOs who wear $10,000 suits or take home multi-million dollar bonus pays every year. They're built in dirty basement garages with CEOs who wear sweatpants to work and uh, survive on a week's supply of ketchup and mustard sandwiches. Now, if you still don't believe me that, you can, uh, that we all have the power to go out there and make a difference in our community, in our economy, do something meaningful with the resources we have, um, then I just wanna remind you of one thing, and that was that less than 20 years ago, a tweet was just a sound that a bird made. Amazon was the name of a rainforest. Facebook was what you called a kid that fell asleep in class. And Alibaba was a character from an Arabic folktale. Now, the reason I say this is because it proves that the world can and does change. It's our choice whether or not we want to be a part of it. Thank you very much for your time.